What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of PNAX, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference from the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have Scott today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Scott Galveo, he's co-founder of Intercultural Elements, also known as ICE, a German-based company with over 50 employees, which helps retailers expand e-commerce sales internationally, which we'll talk about. Before Intercultural Elements, he cut his teeth working on a wide range of international e-commerce for more than six years at Auction Master and Channel Advisor UK as an implementation manager. And from my research, Scott, ICE is often incorrectly pigeonholed as a translation company, but it's more accurately described as an A to Z service provider. So I'm going to have you talk about some of the things that you provide, which maybe people who know you don't even know about. Uh, A random fact about Scott is he holds a degree in both intercultural communication and geography from University of New Mexico, and he's lived in Germany from 2000. Scott, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. What's some of the next big things, uh, marketplaces to, to watch out for? Right. A couple of nice ones. Um, you know, ones like Zalando, that's really sort of right up the road from us. Uh, Berlin is, is not too, uh, too, too far away. Um, you know, auto in Germany can be really good. Uh, but as you said, very much just depends on the category. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, UK also has some really interesting ones. Like, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily count as a, a marketplace, but flub it. You know, Flubbick is, is a really cool one hmm. um, and an interesting concept that, that you can look at. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there, but, you know, even going beyond sort of the, the, the confines of Europe, um, you know, Japan, right, uh, Mexico, uh, South America in general with Mercado Libra offers a, a huge potential, um, especially if you uh, utilize things like Amazon FBA in the U.S. to send to Mexico. Um, you know, really good idea there. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned Japan a couple of times, but, you know, whether you can get on Rakuten, if you can sort of fulfill the requirements to do that, uh, or Amazon Japan, right, which is a little bit, a little bit more familiar, um, great opportunities for you. What do you find the hardest to translate or to, to get on out of the marketplaces? Right. I, Let's say one of the marketplaces, which is probably uh, the most challenging, is uh, is La Redoute in France. Um, the history of it was uh, sort of similar to how we had Sears in the U.S., and that was like the dominant catalog marketplace for right. really decades. Uh, La Redoute had you know this incredible history, and um, they were a little bit late getting into the online game. But when they did, uh, they decided where okay, we, we can't really compete with the likes of uh, of Amazon or sort of you know these up and coming ones like C Discount, which have lower prices. So we're going to sort of stick with what we do best, and we're going to go for the high end. Um, so I believe you know through our partnership with La Redoute, uh, we've heard that they generally accept about three percent of the sellers who actually ask to sell on their market. Really, so, only three percent? Three percent, yeah. So. It's like the Harvard of marketplaces or something? It's like, incredible. It's incredible, right? So Why do they um, do that? You know, they, well, number one, they sell their own brand. So to that extent, I think they don't want the competition on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I, you know, I, I think they do want to keep it almost a bit elitist. Like when you look at the, uh, you know, that clientele that, to buy that in France, especially with French fashion and all this, um, you know, they, they do want to be that upper level. They want to keep it and they, they retain top that. tier. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So from the challenges, what have been some of the milestones that you're proud of? The milestones, you know, I, I think that links right in with the challenges. It's been great to be able to uh, to deliver some of the things that the people have needed. For example, you know, that quick turnaround time on on global returns, right, to be able to off- offer those local wa- return warehouses. Yeah. Um, you know, also different languages that people have requested as well. Um, you know, 
with you know at this point we have around about 55 people um, in house and uh, and of that 16 different nationalities right so even though that sounds like a lot we're still nimble enough to be able to like add on languages relatively quickly yeah. as we see them uh, needed um, one of the latest ones that we've uh, popped on is is Sweden uh, and Swedish right hmm. uh, for uh, Findig is a you know, marketplace has been established there for a while, but more and more, especially Europeans, want to go into the Nordics, and that's a great way to get in there. So I think a milestone for us um, has been add, able to, to add those languages uh, as quickly as we have. What have you found, Scott, in the German market or German Amazon that is very popular that to you it's obvious, but if someone from the U.S. looked at the categories and the products, they would have no idea like this is one of the most popular products in, in Germany? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's there's a specific product that that I would say because I, I think a lot of the same things sell pretty well. Yeah. Um, to to maybe switch the question a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, one thing which which a lot of people find quite useful is, especially if you're selling from the states, is if you if you develop or you know and or manufacture something in the states, right? Um, it can be great to actually sell that uh, in Germany and really market it as such. Right, we're really? very big on Made in the yeah, USA. Ab absolutely, right? Because you know any types of sort of sporting equipment um, or you know any types of products that am that American um, Americans really have a name for, uh, you know, you want to advertise that uh, in foreign countries because it, it does get some airplay. This, you know, we're big proponents of you know if it's made in Germany, definitely saying that. If you can slap a Union Jack on it, uh, you know that generally gets more sales in foreign countries. So uh, to that extent, anything produced in the USA definitely advertise that. What's the perception of the U.S. in Germany in the e-commerce world? Like you just said, made in USA that has a certain status. I would actually think, yeah, if a German on it, that would have more status than made in the USA. Um, what's the perception of the U.S. from? I mean, you've lived there for since 2000 for 17 That's, years at this point. Yeah. Are there certain like I, commonly held beliefs that would surprise me or people in the U.S.? Right. Yeah. I think perhaps, perhaps, yeah. I mean, the anything to do with with uh, with healthcare, with sporting equipment, things like that, tends to be pretty well respected. I would I would say in the U.S. Um, well, let's say you know if if uh, Germans see that it's coming from the U.S., that's sort of developed there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's there's a general respect for it. Um, I think you know technology and things like that. They they very often like that you know coming from Germany, but uh, right. But yeah, you know, like manufacturing, uh, like Germany, like what what would they consider is, I guess, higher perceived value in U.S. and then what's considered higher perceived value in Germany? So the sports and then the healthcare is more uh, maybe higher perceived in the U.S. What would be higher perceived is in uh, German compared to U.S. Gotcha, right? I mean, I, I think any sort of uh, technology. Or things like that. I mean, you know, everything. You have the sort of stereotypes of cars and things like that. Right, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that that type of thing. I think they like to buy German. You'll see a lot of BMWs and, and Mercedes driving around. Um, so I think there's a general uh, understanding that they feel like they're sort of uh, superior with that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but they you know, a are. lot of other. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be. And, but but uh, you know. But you know. We always like to think of these things as everything is just sort of different, right? And you can sell, and it's sort of funny because even my German friends here, you know, sometimes I'll go on about, uh, you know, the craft beers in the U.S. And um, the stereotype there They're is everybody's just like, yeah, everybody's just like, what? American beer is terrible. And I was just like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, maybe 20 years ago. But if you look at, you know, this this whole industry, which has uh, sprung up and now like, you know, every other town have, has its own craft brewery. Right. Um, it's incredible stuff, right? So I think we have to see it as that. And you have to be able to, if you have a good story behind your product, then you can make it so it's attractive. I yeah. think that's one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't sort of hide behind or, or get stifled by stereotypes. Instead, tell your story. So, Scott, what um, level seller would be a good fit for intercultural elements? I assume not everyone is. Who, who's a good fit to actually use you? Right, right. You know, we have everybody from relatively small sellers all the way up to sort of smaller enterprise level. Mm -hmm. um, so we can cater to everybody. And, and I think we can do that because uh, we have an account manager who is 
your main contact. Um, but that account manager, let's say that she's French in one case, right? As soon as you're expanding to, uh, you know, to Spain, then she'll turn around and get, you know, the Spanish account manager to then help her uh, to, to get you onto those marketplaces, right? Um, so to that extent, you know, I would say that the only size limitation is you have to be um, able to be able to ship more product and um, really keep up with the sales. I, I think that's that's the biggest thing. So a lot of our most successful sellers um, have been people who have started off, you know, really selling pretty well, maybe like, let's say, 10,000 a month, something like that. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, you don't have to be real big to, to start expanding. You mm -hmm. know? So I want you to talk a little bit about some of the you probably see a lot of people using various softwares and things like that. What um, softwares and products do you recommend to some of your, your sellers that they use? Right. Gotcha. So I think the, the main software that, that we're um, in a day to day uh, sort of touch point with is our, our listing tools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have the standard ones out there that I'm sure everybody's aware of. Uh, but, you know, I think some that do a really good job, you know, everything from sort of like Volo, Linworks, uh, Channel Advisor are some of the ones that we deal with the most. Um, but, you know, there's, there's tons of them out there. Um, I think the key is really just making sure that uh, given your expansion goals, right, um, you know, don't get into a listing tool or any other software for that matter that that can't cater to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's one limitation that we see. People go down the wrong road. They, you know, they sort of paint themselves into a corner and then can't expand because the software doesn't cater to You it. mean they get the wrong listing tool for their needs? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, very often when people come to us, they say, you know, I want to take over the world, right? I want to go to these like 10 different countries. And we say, great, perfect. What kind of listing tool are you using? And then we find out that they, it can only go to two countries, right? So um, I think on, on the, the, the seller's part, you know, just make sure that uh, the software is big enough for your dreams. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully, uh, you know, software wise, you know, it, it is nice to see that uh, a lot of these companies are developing uh, sort of in the breadth as as well as in the depth of just their home country. So what are some of the common ones you see? You see Channel Advisor, who else? What are some other common ones people are using? Right. I mean, you know, like I said, a, a couple of ones that we see on a pretty uh, common basis, uh, Volo, since we have a lot of UK sellers, mm -hmm. um, that tends to, to, to go pretty well. Uh, Linworks is uh, relatively inexpensive mm -hmm. um, and serves a lot of sellers quite well. Um, again, UK based. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other ones in Germany too, uh, ones like Plenty Markets, Tradebyte, um, you know, all good software. Um, you know, you just have to take a look at it and make sure that it, it, it serves your needs. Yeah. So besides listing tools, what other software are people using that you'd uh, say look into? Right, exactly. You know, to be honest, we, we really, uh, we rely a lot more on sort of our, our internal, um, yeah, account managers and things like that. So actually, there's really not a lot of uh, of a lot of other software that that we deal with, besides, of course, uh, you know, Amazon Seller Central. That's something yeah. a lot of sellers use, but but not a lot of uh, other ones. You have something called Amazon Scout. Correct. What's that? Right. So we have the uh, you know, a lot of our sellers have the issue that uh, let's say that, that you're a seller, you sell a bunch of products. Let's say two thousand products. Um, now, I've mentioned a couple of times you want to find a, a proper strategy, right, before going abroad. Yeah. Instead of just saying, well, I've gotten some sales from the UK, I'll go there, right? Um, you know, since it takes so much time and effort and resource to go into a new marketplace, you want to make sure that you're, gonna, you're going uh, to the best marketplace. So Amazon Scout is a way to do that. What it does is it takes your UPCs or EANs um, or ASINs if you have them, and it will then uh, search for all of those products on all the Amazons around the world. If it finds your products on other Amazons, it will return data on those. It'll include really important stuff like, okay, who's selling it in uh, country by country? What are the price points, right? Um, and based on that data, you can see a good number of things. Number one, you can see who your competition is, right? Yeah. If you're going to be competitive in that market, right? Um, and, you know, if you um, it's sort of hard to describe without s sort of showing a chart here, but uh, basically we have charts which show pie charts and it will show uh, compared to the sellers who are currently selling that product. If you were to sell your products there, you're going to be cheaper on, let's say, 84 percent of it. So that's mm. a no brainer that you have to get into that. Right. Uh, to that market. 
Right. Yeah. And of course, by identifying which uh, products are already sold there, um, you know, you can, if it's the same product, you can piggyback on that listing. Hmm. So it negates the need to translate anything, right? You're there in, in an instant and very often you're cheaper. Yeah. So that's Amazon Scout in a nutshell. So Scott, I really appreciate your time on this. This is very interesting. I'm sure people make a ton of mistakes when going to all these foreign countries. Um, I have one last question, um, but I want people to check out um, the website. Where should we point people towards? I have intercultural dash elements dot eu are there any yeah. other websites that we should point people towards or places online or is that the best place you know i think intercultural dash elements dot eu for european union that's that's the one to go to that's our home site okay. so, yeah. so before i ask the last question what have we not talked about that you think would be important with selling internationally or inter intercultural elements right um you know one thing we haven't talked all that much about is customer service and hmm. that is that's another thing where we see people um, trip up on, especially when you're doing it yourself. So um, I would give the tip that, you know, uh, all the things we've talked about, you can get it translated correctly, localized, you can get it put it up there. Uh, and, you know, let's say that you're doing really well, it's all going to fall flat if you don't have that customer service backing you up. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain countries where you absolutely do not want to, uh, or say it a different way, you want to have native speakers um, answering your emails. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Japan is probably uh, the best. Yeah. How, do you, how would people do it on their own in Japan? They just throw in Google Translate and then Absolutely. upload it. Really? Yep. That's, that's how it, they do it. it, it Exactly. And, uh, and you know, one thing I would just mention, if I can, you know, th there's a great uh, uh, blog series, you know, this certain blog article that we have yeah. called Up and Coming Marketplaces. Uh, I think we published it last year and it was talking about uh, Where Mexico can and Japan. They find it? So right on our website, so intercultural-elements.eu, mm -hmm. and then uh, there's a basically a resources, resources section and then a yeah. blog. And um, under that, we tell uh, a story of how um, – uh, right. So, so basically, uh, one of our Japanese uh, customer service representatives talked about how very often it has to do with the details, uh, something that we as Westerners wouldn't necessarily pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, examples would be things like we actually got complaints from Japanese buyers who received a shirt and shirt itself was absolutely fine. The problem was that the tag, you know, the thing that you normally just rip off and throw away, that was bent slightly. And that warranted a complaint. Mm. Second one was yeah, somebody expected how do something you, to be. How do you avoid that? Though? <laughs> exactly. And that's the whole thing, right? Uh, but it, that's, you know, so to a large extent, it's, it's very difficult to avoid those types of things. But he basically says just be really careful of the details. Um, something that is probably avoidable, maybe a better example, is something was advertised to, go, to, to arrive in a box. Again, you throw the box away. It doesn't really matter. But it arrived in a bag. Um, and that warranted a complaint, even though the product itself was fine. Um, mm. But perhaps the, the key there, even more to, than, than how you treat your products, is uh, the customer service aspect. Mm -hmm. um, most w Westerners don't know there's actually uh, multiple politeness forms in Japanese. And Google Translate simply cannot cater to that. It can't understand it. But if you use the wrong one, then you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself uh, somebody them. being yeah somebody's going to be offended and you're going to get a negative so hmm. uh, so yeah so customer service super important get native speakers you know it, it's something that intercultural elements offers but you know there's other companies out there as well that offer it but you know get natives to take care of that for you as you yeah. expand so Scott my last question is sure. I'm curious what conferences you like um, and then. You're going to the Prosper Show. How can people Absolutely. get the most out of the Prosper Show when they go? Right. It, it's, to be honest, it's, it's hard not to. Um, yeah, so Prosper Show was uh, – it's, it's really uh, – so the first time that it, it was sponsored was or, or that it was put on was last year. Um, and, uh, and we sponsored it straight away because we thought it really catered to the clientele that, that we were looking to contact. Mm -hmm. um, and incredible. Um, so I, I gave a speech there last year. Uh, just really great, I think, turnout. But what did you talk good. about? So I talked about um, expansion into uh, a lot of marketplaces that the people may not necessarily expect to go to. So we sort of stayed away from the Amazons by and large, but we talked about everything from some of the emerging ones in like Southeast Asia to South America um, to, to other you know ones that you may not expect even in Europe. Uh, so yeah, so chat about that. But you know, Prosper Show is a, is a great show to go to. Um, that's coming up in, in just a, a you know a month or two. Um, I definitely recommend that. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, yeah, I mean, some other ones where I find that you find 
some really good content. Um, you know, Channel Advisor's Catalyst, right? Uh, they have one on both sides of the pond, right? Um, that's really great. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the ones that are that are out there, um, IRCE in Chicago. Um, so we're heading that to the uh, to that for the first time this year, but heard that that's really full with great content. Um, and then some European ones actually uh, that are up and coming as well. Nice. Uh, yeah. So in any case. Scott, I appreciate your time. This has been great. Everyone should check out intercultural-elements.eu. And if they want to sell internationally, they need to check it out. Great. Hey, thanks so much for your time, Jerry. Thanks, Scott. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.